As you know, I like to record the start of these podcasts out and about in London or wherever I am. I feel like recently I've sounded very out of breath on this podcast, but I'm not getting unfit, honest. I think it's just been very cold, and when it's very cold, you just sound a bit out of breath. This is Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality, and motivation. I'm Tony Wrighton. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Last week, uh, we talked about digital detox and whether we're all a little bit addicted to tech and distracted by digital. Um, Today, I feel like today's podcast does slightly tie in with last week's podcast because it's about, well, it's really about happiness and integrity and how to be happy. And turns out one of the ways to do that is to kind of connect more with our natural selves. And that is certainly what Martha Beck talks about. Martha Beck is an extraordinary woman, a best-selling author, a well a bit of a coup to get her on this podcast to be quite honest and I was really thrilled to speak to her not least because she's such good fun and one of the things you'll hear about in this podcast is how to make a whole load of wild turkeys lie down and meditate that's pretty much it someone there not not sounding quite as happy (laughs) maybe he needs to listen to this how to be happy podcast probably a bit young to be quite honest Um, So this is the new rules for living with energy, vitality and motivation. More from me a little bit later on, but now here is Martha Beck on Zestology. I like to tell the story of one's life backwards. So apparently I, I, to get to the place where I am now, where I do all the things you just mentioned, I I did not set out with any conscious intention. I just lived a life that put me through some difficult experiences, especially early on, and then spent a few years trying very hard to figure out how to be happy. And at the time I was a professor and my students started asking me more about how to be happy than about international business management, which is what I was supposed to be teaching them. (laughs) And then they started paying me to just um, tell them stuff. And uh, there were so many that I felt I'm very reclusive. So I wrote a book thinking, hey, it's 25 bucks. They can just get out of my hair. This is everything I know. Thinking that they would go away. And it just backfired horribly. And more people came. And then I had to write more books. And it's just been a vicious cycle since then, Tony. I don't know what else to tell you. Yeah. Wow. Why, why, did, why were they turning to you on happiness? Uh, yeah, I was figuring out things that I thought everyone knew. For example, I had um, three autoimmune diseases that are considered incurable and progressive that cause continuous pain. But I noticed I kept very careful records because of my sociology training. So I would keep um, statistics, essentially and then run regression equations on what related to what. And I did it with my own pain. And I noticed that when I did certain activities, and then even when I thought certain thoughts, I was in less pain. Well, pain, physical pain is very motivating. So I began doing more of the things that created ease in my body and less things that created pain in my body. And it changed the course of my entire life. But I thought that was pretty obvious. Like if something makes you you feel horrible Mm. perhaps you should do Mm. less of it if it makes you feel wonderful maybe do a little more of it (laughs) still to this day i go to like some big executive audience and i lay that one on them and they're like what wait go back yeah (laughs) well it's true isn't it but actually when you say it like that i think god there's loads of things i do i don't like very much and don't make me feel very Mm -hmm. good (laughs) right Right, and I just don't do them. And from this, I have earned my living. <laughs> oh, that's, that is brilliant. Do you know what, though? When, and, and the great teachers do manage to distill um, what could be a complicated message into something very simple, don't they? Yeah, that's what... Right now, I'm writing a book uh, called The Integrity Cleanse, which is another of the same... It's along the same lines, but I, for the last three years, I've been doing a project where I refuse to do anything that causes even slight division in me, like, like double mindedness, self questioning. I mean, I question myself all the time, but if I do something that feels wrong to part of me, I, that's not allowed anymore. So even having a facial expression that doesn't reflect what I'm really feeling is off the table. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, and what I've found is that being that true to yourself 
it creates feelings. That, first of all, the three diagnosed incurable diseases that I have are completely asymptomatic. They, they're gone, which is not supposed to be possible. What were they? Um, I have uh, interstitial cystitis, which most people have to have an organ removed for that one. Oh I have granuloma oh annulare, which is a skin lesion thing. And then I have a general sort of bucket diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Yeah. Um, which I which kept me almost bedridden for twelve years until I figured out that if I just do what I want, it goes away. Oh my goodness. But the oh integrity plans is like this this incredible purity of intention and action. And here's the crazy thing that happens. You do it for the peace of mind and the peace of body, but as you do it, miracles follow. Like intensely Integrity. Bizarre. This is with integrity. Living yeah, everything, always, every reaction, every moment with integrity. Yeah. The more true we are to ourselves, the more it becomes apparent that what we're intending and the way our consciousness functions, in our, it gets very, very clear. And then it starts popping into the circumstances around us in really like statistically vastly unlikely ways uh, the the whole new age ridiculous fall to all about your intentions manifesting and everything it i hate to say it but it actually works yeah but the key to it isn't like gripping onto your desires it's just being clear and so you end up being able to create miracles and having no real desire to do so it's so, an so odd what, so what's an example of that because i feel like i'm, I'm on the page but i but i, I need okay. a real world example of how that might work i'll give you a really simple one i mean one thing is that situations i've imagined that seemed very improbable just um come to life around me like people who i've i'll give you a good example i started this integrity cleanse because i have I've, I've always kept a few books by my bed and reread them and they've always like reoriented me and helped me feel grounded. And the work of Byron Katie, who's a spiritual teacher is one of my main favorites. Yes. And then the work of Stephen Mitchell, who's a translator um, who translated a copy of the Dao, a version of the Tao Te Ching, which is a Chinese ancient book that I love, but I love all his books, his translations of Rilke. These two, they happen to be married to each other. And, they, I've always kept their books by my bed. Like these have been my parents. I called them my paper parents. <laughs> and then one day I happened to be at a place where we were both being interviewed, Katie and I. And the next day, Katie and Stephen, my two like idols, yeah. show up at my hotel room and say, we want to drive you back home, which is a, like a three and a half hour drive. And I said, why? And they said, we just know to do it. And I was like, really? Really? And so it was on that drive yeah. that they started peppering me with questions about my integrity. Like, was I living in absolute, absolute accord with my inner self? And I said, I'm going to go on an integrity cleanse uh, just to please you guys. But but we've talked every week since then. And they became like real dear friends in my life instead of just on paper. And I, still, they won't tell me why. <laughs> wow. Like I was sitting meditating on, I, I live on this ranch in the woods in California and we have wild turkeys here, these huge birds. And they're very, they're hilarious. I call them the legislature because they're just, just completely <laughs> idiotic and ridiculous. But one day I was meditating and I had gotten into this thing of stillness and I was just meditating on the word stillness. And I, I opened my eyes and there was a flock of turkeys in front of me and they were all in different poses, absolutely motionless, like statues. Yeah. And I sat there and just watched them for like a minute. And they, I mean, not an eyelash did they move. And then I just thought, I wonder how many. So I started counting them. And immediately they like came out of this trance and started clucking and pecking like they usually do. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. When I count, they seem to come out of it. And then I thought, okay, back to meditation. And I went into stillness again, closed my eyes. When I opened my eyes, all, there were 17 turkeys. All 17 of them were lying flat on the ground with their necks out, completely limp. I've never seen turkeys behave this way. They were all, again, they were so relaxed. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And it was just weird. It was weird. That's so an, an I, unspoken energy, isn't it? That there's, it's very hard for us to explain because 
our civilization at the moment hasn't worked out why that, but there's clearly something going on between you and the legislature. <laughs> well, it's extremely hard to understand because right now you and I are talking on wireless communication devices, which are electrical in nature. Yeah. We are electrical devices made of meat. Our nervous systems are electrical. Why shouldn't we have wireless communication? Mm. Why not? It just makes sense. Have you have you heard of the um, the Qigong experiments where there's a Qigong practitioner in in San Francisco, and there's four petri dishes in New York, and each petri dish has some cancer cells in it, and the mm. Qigong sends healing energy. The master he sends healing energy across cities to one petri dish, and after yep. thirty days, the other three petri dishes the cancer cells had grown and then in the in the petri dish that he'd been sending the good vibes to the cancer cells had gone it's so interesting yeah. it is so interesting and there and there are many many studies that have similar similarly unbelievable i put that in quotation marks uh results for our culture and so they're heavily criticized but i was really i had hardcore training in social science at harvard for mm. a lot of years and these experiments, when you look at the design and the construction and the execution, they are robust. They are much more carefully controlled than the vast majority of other medical and social science experiments, and they are replicable. Like they, the, the prayer studies where people who are prayed for without knowing it get better um, at, a quick, at a statistically improbable quicker rate than people who aren't prayed for, that study has been replicated and replicated by scientists trying to disprove it. Right. And they finally did one where it didn't have an effect. But if you look at the design of the study, they, they found people who did not believe in prayer and did not believe that it would work as one of their conditions. The people doing the praying were only allowed to join the experiment if they did not believe it would work. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one that's quoted so much, isn't it? And, you know... Yeah. Um, it's I mean and I'm so pleased that we're chatting because this podcast is around energy and on a more kind of basic level living with energy day to day and it was very interesting that you mentioned fibromyalgia because I, I mm. contracted this tropical virus I had loads of loads of time off work and was in bed and that was one of the words that kind of came up again and again and I know how people suffer with it um and yeah. then on a kind of a, on a more kind of esoteric level um and energy like what we've just been talking about um, so, yeah. so in both areas, I'm so pleased that we're chatting. Um, would well, you call it spirituality, though? Because I sometimes have a bit of a problem with the word spiritual. Yeah, because it's associated with religion. And one of my um, memoirs is about how I was raised in a, an extremely religious Mormon society and how that just about destroyed me and, and maybe run for the hills. Hmm. So I, I understand people who have strong negative associations with words like spirituality and religion. So I went looking at all the, the pre-Christian and non-Christian ancient traditions looking for common elements. And it's interesting, in, in each tradition you'll find a lot of people who are credulous, who are um, who believe things that we would call magical thinking that aren't yeah. testable, they don't hold up. And there are rare individuals who have capacities that are very bizarre in light of our culture's materialist, rationalist leanings. And all the people that I met who can really do these things don't like religion and spirituality as the culture <laughs> sees it. So there is there is this weird schism and we run out of words with which to talk to it, partly because, and one of the things it says in the Tao Te Ching is that the Tao that can be spoken of, the way that can be spoken of is not the true way. Those who talk don't know, those who know don't talk. It's not a verbal, actually the part of the brain that is nonverbal is the part that seems to be active in these energetic uh, interactions and creations. And therefore it defies language and language deconstructs it and makes yeah. it ineffective. Yeah, but it's there, it's real. So um, it's no good trying to find another word for spirituality because actually no word will be good enough. People codify it, they make it legalistic, they become dogmatic, they become insincere um, or, or attached to creating results, power, wealth, and status, and it all goes the same way th that religion always seems to go. It's also, it's considered by sociologists a non-social behavior. 
It's a numinous behavior. It takes place between the individual and some non-social force. So um, I'm very interested now in leaving culture and connecting to nature, your own nature and, and nature writ large, um, because nature is full of magic and culture is full of desecration. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's why it's so lovely that you live with your turkeys. I do. I had, there came a point I was leaving the, the African bush and I was in Johannesburg, which is gorgeous and it's called a, an urban forest. But I, I'd been in the bush for a month and I looked out at the city and I thought I, I literally will die if I have to live in a city anymore. Really? And I got, yeah, I got home from Africa and I managed, I was very jet lagged. I managed to get out of, go to the store and get some ice cream and go to California and get a ranch in that week. <laughs> <laughs> Just interrupting the interview for one moment to tell you that this podcast is brought to you by the website ketoclubuk.com bringing you the best ketosis supplements including something that I have every single day uh, brain octane in my coffee you've probably heard me banging on about this bulletproof supplement before uh, bulletproof brain octane it's a type of MCT oil um, it's pretty much the finest MCT oil that money can buy and uh, you can get it at a very good price on ketoclubuk.com and if you're not in the UK I'm not sure that you can get it <laughs> but if you are it's a great place to go and there's all, all kinds of info about keto on there as well right back to the show so going back to the, the um your students who would come to you and they'd say um how can I be happy what w- what mm. would you say to them and what would you say would now say, what I always start with and I, I train coaches and what I always say is start with the point of least satisfaction which for someone who's in pain will be the point of most suffering because suffering is the gift that is trying to, to show us the way. And if you go to the, the strongest suffering, that will always be the entry place for where change needs to occur. And as you start to change it, your suffering recedes. And the whole, whole object is to live without suffering. That's the motivating thing. So what in your life hurts most? You know, take some time to figure it out. And then we go in and look at why you're doing that. And it may be that you feel you can't help it maybe because that's what everyone does, but there will be a belief system that's holding you into a pattern of action that is wrong for you. And if you don't change that belief system, the actions never change. So we work at the level of releasing attachment to beliefs and we don't give other beliefs. It's not a religion. It's let go of what you believe. And then instead of another belief, you exist in perpetual creative response to whatever is present and you know to do things. And it's a very peculiar sensation and not one that's in the culture, but it's how all yeah. other animals live. Yeah. Yes. And it's how nature works. Yes. Yeah. So that's what we do. And, and, and find being, suffering, uh, find, yeah. get rid of it. And then that being present bit that you just mentioned, I'm increasingly becoming aware that I'm actually, and I think this goes, uh, even as a child, I'm not very good at being present or I just have to work hard at it. Um, and I, it, even if it's around the dinner table or certainly in a kind of classroom setting, my mind just flies off. And I guess well, everyone suffers with that to a certain extent. But um, it's not but, easy, is it, mm-hmm. being present? Uh, it, it is. There's nothing easier, but you're being guided. So if I were to tell you to get into a vat of toxic sludge and, you know, swallow <laughs> it in, drink it in, open your mouth, open your whatever oh boy here comes the truck and the dogs are going to go bananas i'm just saying oh that's Um, good that'll be exciting it's It's background noise it's great oh yeah um (laughs) but if the reason you're not present at that dinner table or in that classroom is that you're trying to do something that isn't pure for you it isn't and, and by this i don't mean any moral judgment but it's not you aren't one person you're divided which means you're not in integrity because the opposite of integrity is duplicity you're divided if you are in a circumstance where you feel the desire to open it will be very easy for you to be present but when you can't be present in a situation um where you are where you're trying hard it means something about that is wrong for you and a message is coming to you that says shut it down move away so for example if you forced yourself to be fully open, present, and relaxed hmm. in a situation that was wrong for you, where you bought into some of the values and that were wrong for you, your fibromyalgia would get much worse. Right. 
Yeah. Is there something or is there not something that for you makes it easy to be immersed in the moment? Yeah, uh, the, the, the one thing is when I concentrate on one thing to the exclusion of all others. In other words, I'm very bad at multitasking. <laughs> That's the, the well, thing actually, that helps me to be brain, present best. The brain doesn't really multitask is what we've found. It does go into something called soft focus where it's taking in information sort of mm. e evenly from, from all around. You can soften the focus of your eyes and put your brain in that state, but you will not have verbal thoughts. Mm. So if, yeah, if you're focused on something you love, or even something that you just feel is important, like getting something out of the heating that could explode, yes. you, know? yeah. you will be very impressed. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is to find things, instead of trying to force yourself to be present in the life you've got, my whole career is based on the idea that if you're not present and it's hard to be present, maybe you're in the wrong place. Yeah. So go to a place where you are present naturally. Don't fight your nature to to agree with culture. Yeah. It, it works well for the social machine, but it doesn't work well for the soul. And it, it's not magic. And on that theme, I, I've been uh, talking on another podcast recently about um, what happens when uh, you've kind of lived a life which has been quite a boozy kind of alcoholic kind of party fueled existence and then you yeah. cut down but all your mates are still doing it and you know I, I, I went out with some of my colleagues last night we had a kind of an end of year party and um, it's it's quite an interesting sensation when you actually don't drink as much anymore because you kind of mm -hmm. you on one level, you start to feel like you're being a bit boring, but actually on another level, you're being far more, you're living with far more integrity because it's actually you as opposed to the kind of the alcoholic you, the drunk you. Yeah. Well, there's more than one way to get drunk. I used to work with um, active heroin addicts on the streets of Phoenix, and I would tell them, I was the only one working at the methadone clinic who kept telling them, you're supposed to feel like you feel on heroin. One. Um, that was not supposed. To, that was not the politically correct thing to say. But I totally believe that when you're doing the right thing in the right place with the right people, you that is the altered state or the non-altered state actually that we're looking to achieve with substances. So we do do things that are wrong for us. It cuts off our magic. It cuts off our joy, which is part of the magic. And then we need medication to tolerate it. Mm. So we drink and it makes us happy for a while. Or we do heroin and it makes us feel blissed out for a while. But as one addiction expert says, the, the cure for standing on a nail isn't to drink more, is to take the nail out of your foot. Yeah. And taking the nail out of your foot requires such radical action. It will take you out of culture and people will think you are the most badass, crazy rebel on earth. And you won't need to drink a drop. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll feel drunk as could be, but with no hangover. It's awesome. As I say to the heroin addicts, I think you should get to feel this way and keep your teeth. <laughs> well, it's a very good point, isn't it? Because actually, it's not about being exciting or not exciting, whether you drink more or less, isn't it? There's plenty of, there's plenty of interesting things. In fact, there's far more interesting things you can do. Um, um, yeah. So the book that you, your paper, what was it? Your paper, mother and father. My paper parents. Yeah. Paper parents. The Tao De Jing. Is that what you said it was? Yeah. Um, Stephen uh, uh, Mitchell's translation of the Tao De Jing. Tell me a bit more about that. Book. Sorry, it, I was a Chinese. I'm really interested in Taoism and that's been a bit, a bit of a theme on the podcast. And in fact, in January, I'm going to Thailand and taking right. a little kind of Taoism course for a few days. And um, yeah, I'd love to know a bit more about that book. Yeah, I majored in Chinese as an undergraduate at Harvard, um, having absolutely no background whatsoever. Um, and it was, it was, I was not good at it and I was fairly wretched, but it did, I did live in Asia for a year and found myself when I came back because I was 20 to 21 and at that age when I, I was just struggling to learn the language right but I came home and when you do learn language you you imbibe some of the culture as well so I, I came home interested in Asian philosophy and was very perplexed by the way people thought around me in that Ivy League setting I would look at them and think what I mean rationalism the way Western rationalism was only one 
possible philosophy to me then. It's, mm. They say the man with one watch knows what time it is. The man with two watches is never sure. <laughs> so I had two cultures in me. And I kept reading works of Chinese philosophy. And when Stephen Mitchells came out, he is such a gifted poet. He is so skillful with language. He actually makes it, takes language to an almost magical level. And when I read his translation, because it's Chinese, especially ancient Chinese, can be translated so many different ways. Yeah. It hit me with so much force. There was so much energy in my body. When I read that book, I was in Utah at the time, and I, I'd been unable to walk for years, and I actually sprinted two miles across a mountain path to stay and under a huge waterfall because the energy in my body, I thought it was going to explode. No way. And I mean, the, yeah. And then I walked back and thought I'm cured. And the next day I couldn't walk again. <laughs> and I just, it's like that kept happening. There, this is what I mean by magic and miracles. I, I just, there was no explanation for what I was experiencing. But that book, it's called The Wisest Book Ever Written. And Taoism, if I had to choose a religion, which thank God I don't, and I don't and call God whatever you want. Um, thank whatever, I have no religion. But Taoism is pretty damn close to a first choice for me because it basically says um, the orderly, follow the way that flows through your body and your mind and your heart and it will not lead you astray. And that's kind of the only doctrine. Mm. Um, and it works. That's, I've just been looking at that book. That looks brilliant. Um, and just in yeah. terms of, so you were, you hadn't walked for years, you said. No, I, I limped. I was on crutches a lot of that time. Sometimes my right leg was just swinging uselessly. Sometimes I could limp, but with enormous amounts of pain for very short distances. And then, but this, it was literally like reading the pages of that book plugged me into some kind of electric socket. Wow. And there was so much energy shooting through my body and out my hands and feet and especially my head. And I thought if I don't, I knew I had to go to a waterfall and stand under this. It was a big waterfall too, not a little one. Yeah. And I thought that's the only thing that was going to equal the fire shooting up out of my head is a lot of freezing cold water coming down. And I never even questioned it. It just happened. And that's actually one of the th things you'll read um, from people who do live in this kind of really pure sense of their own truth. And that is that often the body goes and does things that you don't expect and probably aren't capable of. But it happens anyway. Yeah. Meh. And and you didn't There's think. Always... And then the next day, you it didn't happen again. Why no, and you know, it was, and that was devastating. But I, this is where I started keeping records and saying, "What am I doing on days when there's less pain, there's more yeah. mobility?" That's an extreme example, but it would, it would happen when I needed it to. Yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it it was very peculiar, and it wasn't following any medical models. And so I just started. I kept a journal, and I wrote records of it. What did I do? What happened to my body? What was I experiencing? Um, and I started to see that certain types of beliefs were shifting. When I, when I read those words, Stephen's words, they're very, very pure and true. They're an approximation of the Chinese. I've read it in Chinese, and it could go any which way. But it is intensely wise. And um, it was the shift in the moment I was reading it. I believed what I was reading. And it was very, very different from my usual belief system, which was based on trying to achieve approval, essentially, yeah. in my yeah. culture. And it that first reading of the Tao Te Ching and Stephen's translation, because he's a Zen monk too, it knocked me out of one belief system and into one that was very true for me. And because of that, my energy went from being extremely low and compressed and dysfunctional to being very, very high and healthy immediately, like in a moment. Yeah. Which isn't supposed to happen. It, it just does. 
<laughs> and going back to what you were saying about integrity, um, do you think that the kind of physical manifestations of pain that you were getting were in some way down to, I know you've written a lot about your kind of how your personal life has changed radically over the years. And do you think that that kind of the, um, perhaps before you weren't living as an honest and integrity kind of filled life as you could have been in terms of your personal life, did that have an impact as well? Oh, that was, that's the entire thing. I was, I was doing my best. I mean, I was raised to be Mormon and then I was raised and then I was as a late teenager through my early thirties, I was in the Ivy league and I was trying to serve one or both of those systems the whole time out of a, a, a genuine desire to be a good person, mm. but I was not mm. living in accord with my own truth at all. And the major the, my if I had a religion, then it was do what it takes to get approval, and that's what we're all taught as children universally. Uh, we come by it innocently enough, but when you realize that that's the problem, and then you say, okay, well, what would I do, whether or not I cared about people's disapproval, then answers start to come back and tell you to do things like, well, I wouldn't be Mormon, that's for sure, and. And then if you don't act on that, you remain crippled. You remain, so whatever I discovered needed, was my truth, I would actually do what it took <laughs> to get in harmony with my inner life, so that my outer life was in harmony with my inner life. So, uh, you know, the first instance was when my son at Harvard was diagnosed with Down syndrome late in the pregnancy. And though I'm very pro-choice, my my genuine desire was to keep the baby. Mm. And that was my first, like, really weird step away from culture. All five doctors at Harvard told me it was like having a malignant tumor and not letting them remove it. By the way, my son is the most profound magician I've ever met. I mean, he is like, whew, yeah. it's like having a circus yeah. ride in the house. Um, Fantastic. But then, you know, so then I was like, yay, my Mormon supporters will be fine until I realized, boy, Mormonism is wrong for me. And then I was <laughs> out of that, so none of them ever spoke to me again. And then I was like, my husband and I at the time were out of Mormonism, and it's like, hey, I think we're both gay. So then that <laughs> happened. And it's like everywhere I went to, I went to Harvard to have a baby with mental retardation. I went to Utah to become a lesbian. This is not a, <laughs> this is not way to get approval. Yet people tell me, give me money to tell them how to live their lives. It's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible talk. We talk about magicians. That's um, that's pretty impressive. So you you and your husband um, were both both decided you were gay. Yeah, well, he'd been he'd identified that way f from childhood, but he was raised Mormon, and he was just trying to Do the right trying to thing. be a good guy, you yeah. know. And and I watched him during our marriage, and it I started to pick up. You're not really, um, yeah. And, and it was very clear to me that when he was gay, he was happy, and when he was trying to be straight, he was miserable. So part of letting go of, I mean, when I during that period after my son was born, I gave up my job, my profession, academia didn't fit me anymore, my religion, all my family of origin, which is vast, mm. um, my marriage, pretty much everything had to go. Wow. And then after that, I fell in love with a woman. It, it wasn't something that I, I am, I was very blessed not to like wrestle with it my whole life. But then there's the whole sexually abused as a child, don't know what the hell to make of Thing. Oh, it's just been a joyride, Tony. It has, hasn't it's, it? Yeah. Um, but it all comes yeah. back to integrity, doesn't it? That's the interesting thing. Yeah. I didn't actually know that was going to be the... I always like to kind of try and think of a title for the podcast while we're doing it. And I think it's going to have to include integrity at some point, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm calling this book The Integrity Clones. And I actually made a little telecourse for it that people could buy at my website. But it goes deeper. I mean, I've been doing it really aggressively for three years and yeah it will get you castigated it will get you thrown out it may get you arrested but it will make you whole and your whole self it's it, magic and miracles are not an aberration the use of energy as a very concrete very uh, self-evident process mm. will be the gift you get from giving up on culture and taking the hits that come with that 
it that is a wonderfully inspiring message um, to kind of do our own thing. Um, and you know, one of the things that I always ask on Zestology is, what is one book you'd recommend? Well, I think we've we've really covered it with the Tao Te Ching, which sounds fantastic. Um, what about yeah, one? Yeah. yeah. What about one tip for living with more energy and vitality? What What would you say? Just every day, make a list of things that you're going to do that day or that you think you should do that day. And notice, go through, look at each one, imagine doing it and see whether it creates tension in your body or a sense of release and freedom in your body. Do a little less of the things that create tension and a little more of the things that create freedom. And it's like steering an aircraft. You move at one degree a day in 100 days, you're going to be in a very different place. That's your secret, Martha, isn't it? You just make everything seem quite simple. It is. It's very simple. It's the game you're getting warmer, you're getting colder. That's it. We all played it as a child. We always found the thing. Yeah. It's, that's all you need. That feels like freedom. The Buddha said that wherever you find enlightenment, you can recognize it because it always tastes of freedom. If it feels free, do it. If it feels like captivity, don't do it. Done. Diddly done. <laughs> um, Martha it's been lovely to talk to you um, I know that you've got kind of various trainings at MarthaBeck.com and your your uh, mailing list is flourishing as well is that the best place for people to find out more about you yes MarthaBeck.com mailing list and we will tell we will send them any information they wish good to have. good well look it's great to talk to you thank you so much for coming on and if you're ever in the UK let us know and we'll meet for coffee and we'll oh, call one in person I, yeah. thanks for what you're doing I Oh, and likewise. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you, Martha. What a brilliant interview. Really enjoyed speaking to her. And thank you for listening to Zestology. Last week's podcast, if you haven't heard about it, with Phil White, all about unplugging from technology. And I wanted to say a quick hello to my friend and Zestology listener, Laura, who messaged me afterwards and said, enjoyed the podcast. And she said that she'd heard a good quote recently, which is... Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. It's a very wise advice. Uh, Enjoyed that. Now, quick reminder, uh, there is a new club in the UK for keto fans, and this is ketoclubuk.com. So uh, it's a good place to buy... Uh, cheap keto products and if you want to use the code zestology you'll get five percent off so it's keto club uk use the code zestology get five percent off and use brain octane every day in your coffee like me well i do it anyway and it seems to work for me Uh, also the zestology book club is up and running if you'd like to join the zestology book club head to facebook type in zestology book club you'll find us you have to kind of um, ask to join and then uh, i will accept you by the way, you can actually add other people to the Zestology Book Club as well. So if there's someone you know who likes books or should be reading more books or is an absolute bookworm, um, you can add them to the Zestology Book Club at the same time. Or maybe you're a member already and you'd like to add someone else. Head to Zestology Book Club and add as many people as you like. And I'd be really grateful for that as well. Good. That's it. Have a great week. Remember, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. See you next time.